We're going to emphasize the idea of things most surely believed amongst us. And I trust that I will be able to communicate and able to motivate. Some of the stories that I tell you may be what I told you five years ago, but I know you've forgotten if I did, so it won't matter. I emphasize simplicity in preaching. Two fellows were in the cattle business and one of them gave the other a thousand dollars and said, go out to Texas and buy us a new bull. And when you buy him, send me a telegram and I'll bring the cattle trailer and get you and the bull. So he took the thousand dollars and went to Texas and he found the bull they wanted to buy, but it cost $999. He had one dollar left. He went into the place to send a telegram and the lady said, you can't send but one word for one dollar. And he thought and thought and said, send the word comfortable. She said, comfortable? Yeah, he said, my buddy back home's a slow reader and when he reads that, he'll read, come for the bull. Now, I hope that the preaching is not bull. One preacher's sermon was said to be like a Texas longhorn, Jimmy. Point here and a point here and a lot of bull in between. (laughs) But one thing I want to emphasize to you in the very beginning is that you need to learn to be yourself. I especially try to emphasize this to younger people. I've tried to learn from a lot of preachers but I can't preach like anybody else. I'm me. You need to watch and learn from every person that you meet. But don't try to just copy anybody. When you do, you'll get into trouble. Two students were sitting side by side and taking a test. There were 50 short answer questions on the test and when they had finished, both of them answered 49 questions right and both of them missed number 15. When they got their papers back, the young lady had a 98 on hers and the young man had a zero on his. He rushed up to the teacher and said, what happened? She said, you cheated. What do you mean? Well, you sat next to this young lady and Both of you answered 49 questions right and both of you missed number 15. He said, how do you know she didn't cheat? She said, well, when you got to number 15, she answered the question, I don't know. And you answered, me neither. (laughs) Now that's about what happens when you start trying to be like somebody else. As Luke began his account of the gospel, he said, For as much as many have taken in hand in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. New King James Version says those things that have been fulfilled among us. Those things that are right. And then down in verse 4, he said that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. I'm pretty sure that I will not tell you anything this week that most of you do not already know. Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 1 at least three times that he was putting those folks in remembrance. And I believe we need to be put in remembrance again and again concerning those things that are surely believed amongst us. You know without my saying it that there are a lot of problems in the church dealing with a lot of subjects. 
And it is interesting now that in some cases when you say I'm a member of the Church of Christ that somebody will say what kind of Church of Christ are you a member of? And that's sad. When I'm not in gospel meetings, I preach for the Madison County Church in Jackson, Tennessee. I still live in Henderson. By the way, when I was here before in October of 09, my wife was still living. She passed away about six months later, eight months later. And for the last almost four years now, I have been alone but determined to go ahead and do as much as I can in the Lord's kingdom. I preach for the church, as I said, in Jackson when I'm not in meetings. There are at least five congregations that I know, maybe more, in Jackson. There are two of those that I would not go to their services. That's sad. Jesus taught in Matthew 16, 18, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell or Hades shall not prevail against it. And most of us know that verse. But it seems that few of us know the next verse. He said, Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I'm told that a better translation of that would be, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth has already been bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth has already been loosed in heaven. And the lesson is that you and I do not have the right to loose something that God has bound. We do not have the right to tell people that they can become Christians doing less than God commands. But on the other hand, we do not have the right to bind where God has not bound. And when you and I start expecting everybody to do everything in the traditional way that we've been doing it, when God has not bound a method, for example, of how to do something, it is just as wrong. And I'm going to tell you something. It's not easy to walk down the straight and narrow way in the middle road without going too far to the left or too far to the right. One of the greatest difficulties that I have is being completely objective about anything. And I think you have the same problem. You see, I tend to come to a conclusion based upon my subjective feelings. And it is extremely difficult to be objective and simply look at the facts. Too many of us are like the fellow who said, I've already made up my mind. Don't confuse me with the facts. Now you've got to think about that one for a moment. Anyway, believing that to be true, I am trying in my gospel meetings particularly to go back to some of the very fundamental principles of God's word and emphasize those. I finished my full-time local work in June of 2005. I began to do full-time meeting work or evangelistic work, averaging about 22 meetings a year and then preaching for smaller churches in the area when I was not in meetings. Since 2005, June of 2005, I've had the opportunity to preach in about 125 gospel meetings. Most of those are with small congregations. 
I've been back to the same church a few times, but I counted up the other day and I've had the opportunity to preach to over a hundred different churches since 2005. One of the reasons I'm doing that is I am totally convinced that some of our soundest, most grounded people in the Bible are in these smaller churches. I'm also convinced that many of these little churches out in the country and small towns are doing very little except meeting together for the services. And so it is my conclusion that if I can spend the rest of my life, and I hope to preach till I'm a hundred, you think I look it now, but I, I am convinced that the best work that I can do instead of concentrating on one local church is to go wherever I can and reinforce a strong faith in God's word and try to wake up and stir up those brethren to do more in the Lord's service. And by the way, you may not know this, but over half of our congregations in the United States have fewer than 50 people. Over half. I say that to give a little background to my plans for this week. After I determined to use this theme, things most surely believed amongst us, and I try to develop at least two new series of lessons each year in meeting work. I'm at the point now that I have about 22 or three different themes that I can use. And I try to be sure that I cover some specific points in every meeting, whatever the theme, with the home, for example, and worship of the church. But when I decided to develop this theme, and this is the first time this year that I have used this theme as such, I sat down and asked myself the question, what are the most important subjects that we need to remind ourselves of what we really believe? And I came up with the 10 that are listed on your brochure. And by the way, if you are new or visiting and you haven't heard me in a meeting before, I preach two sermons each night instead of one. Now don't get to afraid. They're about 20 minutes each. And so I can work 10 lessons into a gospel meeting, Sunday morning Bible study one, worship one, because we need time for the Lord's Supper. And then two each night, Sunday through Wednesday. We're going to deal with the Bible. What do we believe about the Bible? And I put that first because every problem that I've seen in the church, in my work, in my observation, can eventually be traced back to whether or not we really believe the Bible to be the Word of God. That's, that's it. That's where we start. This morning at worship service, we'll talk about what we really believe about God. Tonight, Christ and the Holy Spirit. Tomorrow night, the church and the home. The next night, worship and salvation. And the next night, Christian living and the eternity. What do we really believe about those subjects? I hope you are not like one person I heard of who was asked what she believed on a certain point. She said, wait just a minute. She went to the phone and called her preacher and said, preacher, what is it we believe on this? If you have to call somebody to see what you believe, you have a problem. 
Now, don't misunderstand me. We do sometimes need help and we do call others and we continue to learn. But if you don't know what you believe, you've got a problem. Folks, too many of us who grew up in the church, and I did, I grew up in a community where there was not a denomination in existence, only the church. For that reason, I'm sure I don't understand some things from an angle that some of you do who grew up in a different setting. But I get to thinking sometimes, is my faith really my faith even at this age? I had an inherited faith for a while. I went to Bible study in church because my dad and mother took me. I think for several years I believed that God existed and Christ was the Son of God because that's what dad and mother said, what others said. The danger is if we're not careful, we will grow up into adulthood still having an inherited faith instead of developing a faith for ourselves and knowing what we believe and why we believe it. What does the Bible mean to you? Preacher was visiting this lady and her little boy and she wanted to impress the preacher and she said, son, go in there in the other room and get that book that mother uses so much and spends so much time. He went and got Sears catalog. Remember when that had been Sears Roebuck, right? What does the Bible mean to you? The best seller, the least read sometimes. I grew up in Jackson County, Tennessee. I told you the community where I grew up was nothing but the church. Jackson County is sparsely populated, but when I was a boy, we had 50 plus churches in the county down to about 38 now. Most of them are very small. And it was generally known among people that those folks at the Church of Christ know their Bible. One day, and, and this happened, they were getting ready for court, at the courthouse in Gainesboro, and they couldn't find the Bible that they used to swear in the witnesses. <coughs> They hunted everywhere and couldn't find it. Finally, the judge said, go out there under that cedar tree in the courtyard and there'll be four men out there whittling. He mentioned one of them by name, said, bring him in here. He's a member of the church of Christ and we'll just use his head for the Bible because he's got more Bible in his head than anybody I know. Would that be said about you today? Let me tell you something. When I started preaching in those early years, and I preached every Sunday as a junior and a senior in high school, I never questioned whether or not my brethren would be behind me if I was preaching from the Word of God. I knew those older folks would support me completely if I stayed with the Word of God. I'm going to be frank with you. I don't always feel that way today. Most of us as preachers in the church are using the majority of our time trying to beg our members to do what they already know they should do instead of being able to get out and bring others to Christ. And that's a shame. How do you look at the Bible? Over in 2 Thessalon or 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13, Paul said, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. He said, what I'm talking about is not the word of men. It is the word of God. Now I want you to put in your mind this 
sentence. The Bible is the blank word of God. We're going to put five words, five different words in that blank. First, think of the statement. The Bible is the word of God. Do you believe that? Do you really believe that? A little boy was talking about believing the Bible and there was a man present who was making fun of him. He said, son, you mean you believe all the Bible is inspired by God? He said, mister, I believe God inspired it from Genesis through the maps. Now, I don't think the maps are inspired. But I'm almost like that little fella. I believe from Genesis, the first verse, to Revelation, the last verse, the Bible is the Word of God. And there's nothing you can believe that's more important than that statement. Now let's plug in five different words. Number one, the Bible is the inspired Word of God. That word inspired by definition means God breathed. By common sense, it means that God, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, inspired 40 men over a period of 1,600 years to write that that we have in the Bible. It has been tested and tried and it still remains as it is today. From Moses, about 1,500 years before Christ, until John, about 100 years after Christ, that's where we get the 1,600 years. We have 40 different authors writing 66 different books as we have it in our Bible, put together so that there is a unity in that complete Word of God. The Bible is the inspired Word of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may believe or that the man of God may be completely furnished unto every good work. That's God's Word. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. The Bible is the inspired word of God. Christ promised the apostles that the Holy Spirit would come and guide them to remember what they had been taught and then to teach everything that needed to be taught. John 14, 16. 16.13 says, Howbeit when he the spirit of truth is come, he shall guide you into all truth. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. That's God's message. That's inspired. And when he inspired those men, he didn't inspire them just to greater ideas. I am convinced that he inspired them, yes, to use their experience, but to guide that in a way that everything that was put down was God's word. No prophecy of the scriptures, any private interpretation. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 teaches. Oh, you have your right to interpretation. I have my right. And we do have the right to believe or disbelieve. God's given us that choice. But I don't have the right to say, this is what I want the Bible to teach, or this is what I'd like for it to teach, or this is what I'm going to accept from it. I have the responsibility to say, this is the inspired word of God. Now, we don't have the original autographs of the Bible. And there can be a problem in translation. I remember hearing Batsel Barrett Baxter say many, many years ago, 
of all the passages in the Bible, and I think he was using the King James Version at the, Bible, at the time, maybe the American Standard. He said of all the passages in the Bible or the verses in the Bible where there has ever been a question about translation, there are only about one-tenth of one percent of all the Bible where there is a question. That would be one in 1,000. And then he said, in none of those passages is there a question but that that point is taught in another place in a way that there is no question. And so from that I have concluded that even though this is a translation, and I still use the King James Version because I've been using it for 60 years and I'm too lazy to learn out of another one, but I refer to others and try to keep in touch. I think some of the translations are more dangerous than others. There is a new one that's come out in the last few years with which I am very much impressed, the English Standard Version. And I encourage younger men to use the King James, New King James, American Standard, New, King, or New American Standard, or the English Standard Version, and I think it's good if we will compare different versions. But stick with one that has emphasized the verbal inspiration of the Word of God. The Bible is the inspired Word of God. Number two, the Bible is the revealed Word of God. Now, there was a time when it was not completely revealed. It's hard for us to understand that those early Christians didn't have a book like this that they could go back to. Many times, even with the Old Testament writings, they just had a scroll or something on a skin like the Ethiopian eunuch probably had with him when he was reading from Isaiah 53. And we'll bring this point into the lesson tonight when we're dealing with the Holy Spirit there was a measure of the Holy Spirit given to early Christians called spiritual gifts that helped them to confirm the message. They didn't have this book that they could turn to like I do, which in other ages was not revealed under the holy apostles and prophets as it is now revealed by the Spirit, Ephesians 3, 5. But it is now revealed. And it seems that those spiritual gifts were for a season until there was the perfect law of liberty described in James 1.25 where they had the written message to prove God's word. That same chapter of Ephesians 3 at verse 9 says, Now to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. See, it was a mystery for a while. But now to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 32. Don't ever let anybody tell you that you cannot know what the truth is. Study the little book of 1 John sometime and underline the word know. Hereby know we that we are in him, 1 John 2, 5. God has revealed his message through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, inspiring those men to write it. And our job today is to keep on revealing it through the preaching of God's word. Paul calls it the foolishness of preaching in 1 Corinthians 1. And now notice he didn't say foolish preachers, although sometimes some of us are. But he said the foolishness of preaching. He was contrasting the wisdom of man and the wisdom of God. And that which seems senseless to the world is the wisdom from God. We need to be involved in continuing to shed light on God's message and reveal it. You'll know the truth. A lot of sins are committed out of ignorance. We simply have not learned what the Bible teaches. The Bible is the inspired word. It is the revealed word. Number three, the Bible is the complete word of God. We notice 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 that 
that one may be complete <clears throat> or perfect. God's word will supply every need that we have. Second Peter 1, 3 says, God has delivered unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. One night I was in a situation discussing something with two Mormon elders. And they told me that I needed the Book of Mormon to go with the Bible. And I said, turn to 2 Peter 1, 3 and read it. And I looked at them and I said, did Peter tell the truth? They haven't answered me yet. If they'd have said yes, they would have proved they didn't need what they were saying. If they'd have said no, they would be calling him a liar. Sometimes you have to ask your questions right. We don't need anything else except the Bible. It says we are begotten by the gospel, 1 Corinthians 4.15, by the word of truth, James 1 says, the word that liveth and abideth forever, we are born again by it, 1 Peter 1.23. The word of God calls us, 2 Thessalonians 2.14, we are born by it, that seed, John chapter 3, we are to live not by bread alone, but by the word of God, Luke 4, 4. What else do we need except the Bible? Oh, somebody says we need something that's a challenge today. We need to get modern, be challenged. Oh, yes. Be ye perfect. Give me a greater challenge than that. Take the gospel into all the world to every creature? Give me a bigger challenge than that. Folks, we don't need bigger challenges. We need bigger people to meet those challenges. The Bible is the complete word of God. And this is sort of a twin point to it. The Bible is the final word of God. Somebody comes in and says, I've got a new message from God. You don't believe it. You meet a creature and that creature says, I'm an angel. And you're convinced that it's an angel from God and he teaches anything other than what's in this book. You're not to believe an angel. Galatians 1, 8 and 9 says that. There is no new revelation. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Matthew 24, 35. He that rejecteth me and believeth not my word hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. The books were opened. And every man was judged out of, of about his life according to what's in those books. I don't know exactly what those plural books mean. To me, I've concluded that it's referring to the patriarchal law, the Mosaic law, and the Christian law because Abraham will be judged by the patriarchal law, David will be judged by the Mosaic law, and you and I will be judged by the Christian law. But I do know what the book of life is there. It tells us that's God's record book. These messages that are in this book are going to be there in the day of judgment and we're going to be judged by the things written in this book. It is the final word of God. Number five, the Bible is the exact word of God. Let there be light and there was light. Lazarus, come forth. Somebody said, why did he call him by name? He didn't want anybody else coming forth. He, he, he specified his name. Joshua, you march around Jericho 13 times. Once a day for six days, seven times on that seventh day. What was important about 13 times? That's the number God chose. Naaman, go dip in the Jordan seven times. Well, I don't see any need in that. And if I've got to dip, aren't the rivers of Abaddon far par just as good here in Damascus? Probably, chemically speaking, they were better. God said, Jordan, seven times. When he came up the sixth time, was he still 
a leper? Yes. God told him exactly what to do. Uzzah touched the Ark of the Covenant to keep it from falling, and God struck him dead. Because God said, don't touch a holy thing. He didn't say don't touch it unless it's about to fall. He said, don't touch it. Leaving Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot and his family, don't look back. And there's a little short verse in the New Testament in Luke that says, remember Lot's wife. Why? For this very thing. Now you, you think about, you're leaving your hometown and you hear all this going on behind you. God didn't say don't look back unless you get curious. Don't look back unless you just can't help it. He said, don't look back. When she did, she became a pillar of salt. Does God mean it when he says there is one body? Does he mean it when he says you must believe, repent, confess, and be baptized? Somebody says, I don't see any sense in being baptized. Naaman, did you see any sense in dipping in the Jordan? When God says assemble and worship and live the Christian life and gives us the principles for that, do you think he means it? Oh, I know the Bible says it, but better remove that little B-U-T. I know the Bible says it, and I'm going to do my best to do exactly what God says. The Bible is the inspired word the revealed word, the complete word, the final word, and the exact word. 